Hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture video. Today we will be covering chapter 10, which is titled Making Capital Investment Decisions. So this chapter continues our discussion from chapter nine where we introduced ways that companies evaluate their capital budgeting decisions. So uh, methods such as net present value, internal rate of return, and so forth. What we do in this chapter is we go one step further where in chapter nine, they provided us the cash flows associated with the project. In this particular chapter, we identify how do these cash flows actually or how are these cash flows actually calculated? So our learning objectives here today, first of all, be able to determine the relevant cash flows for a proposed investment, to be able to compute project cash flows, and then lastly, understand the various methods for computing operating cash flow. So starting off, when we are evaluating projects, we are evaluating multiple projects at the same time, and when we're looking at one project in particular, we need to identify which cash flows from this project are considered relevant cash flows and should be included in our analysis. So the cash flows that should be included in our capital budgeting analysis are those that will only occur or not occur if the project is accepted. So these are cash flows that come about as a direct consequence of the decision to take on a project. Another name for these uh, relevant cash flows are called incremental cash flows because they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they occur incrementally, sorry, they occur incrementally um, when they are choosing to accept or move forward with a particular project. Incremental cash flows are the difference between a firm's future cash flows with a project and those without the project. So we are able to isolate these cash flows from the rest of the firm by using what is called the standalone principle. So what we are doing is we are evaluating a project separate from the rest of the firm's operations, and we are able to identify the relevant cash flows that are associated specifically with the acceptance or rejectance of a particular project. So first of all, we need to ask ourselves the right question when we are looking at these different cash flows. First, you should always ask yourself, will the cash flow occur only if we accept the project. If the answer is yes, it should be included in the analysis because it is incremental, a cash flow that would only occur if the project is accepted. If the answer is no, then we should not include it in the analysis because it's going to occur anyway. And then if the answer is part of it, then we should include the part that occurs because of the project. Now, we certainly simplified things in our, uh, in our discussion here today. Um, in identifying these relevant cash flows. Uh, but the key thing to ask yourself is, will the cash flow only occur if we accept the project? That's our main question as we're looking at cash flows associated with a particular project. So there are a few main categories of cash flows. And let's ask ourselves, is this a cash flow or this is this a type of cash flow that will only occur if we accept this project? If it is, then we include it in our analysis. If it does not or if it is not uh, does not meet that criteria, then we would not use it in our analysis. So we'll ask ourselves these questions as we go into these different categories. So the first type of cash flow is a sunk cost. So a cost, a, a sunk cost by definition is a cost that has already been incurred and cannot be removed and therefore should not be considered in an investment decision. So this is not a cash flow that would only occur if the project is accepted or rejected. This cash flow has already occurred, so we're not going to use it in our analysis of the cash flows associated with the acceptance of a project moving forward. So some examples of sunk costs would be um, consulting fees before you launch the project or research and development before you launch the project. Uh, for those of you that play poker, um, when you are sitting in the small blind or the big blind, those blinds are considered sunk costs. Uh, so those should not be uh, cash flows that are associated uh, or should not be included when you uh, move forward with your analysis of relevant cash flows. Second type of cash flow is opportunity costs. So opportunity costs, the definition is the most valuable alternative that is given up if a particular investment is undertaken. So this is one of those scenarios where it is a cash flow that actually does not occur because you choose to move forward with a project. And so this is actually considered a relevant cash flow. So what is an example of an opportunity cost? Let's say you own an asset that you could sell and earn some type of cash flow, or you could use it in, a, in, in another project. If you use it in the project that you're evaluating, then you lose that opportunity to sell, you lose that opportunity. So we do include that in our cash flow uh, analysis, as that is a cash flow that is not occurring due to us actually accepting to move forward with a project and use this asset in that project uh, instead. 
Third category would be side effects. So side effects are positive or negative effects to other projects already in operations. So you could have positive side effects, so benefits to other projects. So let's say Nike is introducing um, a new tennis shoe, and that new tennis shoe uh, increases sales of of let's say their their basketball sales well that would be a positive side effect due to taking on this new tennis shoe project on the other hand more, more commonly used you have negative side effects so these are costs to other projects and the term for these negative side effects is erosion so erosion is the cash flows of a new project that come at the expense of a firm's existing projects so for example with that example with nike let's say nike introduces a new tennis shoe when they do so it decreases sales of existing tennis shoe sales so that would be a negative side effect of moving forward with this new tennis shoe uh, construction so side effects are cash flows that occur or do not occur as a direct result of moving forward with a project. So side effects are another type of relevant cash flow that should be included in our analysis. Other common type would be changes in networking capital. So normally a project will require that the firm invest in networking capital in addition to long-term assets, so invest in their short-term assets. Um, so the key thing about networking capital, and this is a relevant cash flow, it's a cash flow that's occurring directly as a result of moving forward with the project. The key thing about changes in networking capital is that you actually get this back at the end of the project. So you get back at the end of the project. So whatever you invest to, in, in networking capital to launch the project, the thought process is at the end or the conclusion of the project, that would become a cash inflow for the company. So for example, you would be collecting on your accounts receivable balance, or you would be selling through the inventory that you initially uh, had a cash outflow to build up your inventory. You would sell through that at the end of the project, resulting in a cash inflow. So the key about changes in networking capital is that cash outflow at the beginning of the project as you're investing in your networking capital at the end of the project is going to be a cash inflow because you're recouping that investment uh, due to, uh, similar to the previous examples I just stated. And then financing costs. Financing costs include interest paid or other financing costs. Now, we are only interested in cash flows that are generated by the assets of the project. So financing costs is actually not a relevant cash flow. However, we do use financing costs. We evaluate that separately, and that goes into calculating your required rate of return. Um, another, uh, another phrase that you might hear for required rate of return is your weighted average cost of capital. So it goes into that calculation as to what do I use as my discount rate when I'm evaluating a particular project. And then the last type of common cash flow is taxes. We are always concerned with after-tax cash flow, and so taxes are also a relevant cash flow that would be included in our analysis. So as we go through this next example, we'll try to identify or, or link up the different cash flows associated with these different common types. But just keep these things in mind that whenever we see opportunity costs or side effects or changes in networking capital or taxes, those are cash flows that we would include. If it's a sunk cost or a financing cost, we do not include that in our analysis for calculating the cash flows for a project. So example number one, Rocky Boots currently sells 52,000 casual boots per year at $42 each and 26,000 hunting boots per year at $84 each. So that is their current operations. They want to introduce a new sandal. This is the new project under evaluation. And it hopes to sell 22,000 of these sandals at $26 each. Now, an independent consultant who costs $4,000 has determined that if Rocky Boots introduces the new sandals, it should boost the sales of existing hunting boots by 3,000 units and then reduce the sales of casual boots by 8,000 per year. And they want to know what is the amount to use as the annual sales figure when evaluating this project. So let's go through the different items here and see if we can link up uh, these cash flows to the different categories that we just discussed previously. So as I mentioned, these are all their current operations. We are looking at the Sandal project. Um, we are looking at the Sandal project independently. And so this would be the incremental cash flows using that standalone principle. So we're looking at the Sandal project separately from their current operations. So these values are not going to be included in our sales figure for um, for the for this new project. 
Now, with this new sandal, they hope to sell $22,000 at $26 a piece. So this is the project under evaluation. So this is a relevant cash flow of $22,000 uh, sandals at $26 a piece. So sales from this new project or sales from this new sandal would equal $572,000. Now, an independent consultant who costs $4,000, that's a cash flow that's already occurred. So this cash flow right here is a cash flow that's going to occur regardless of whether or not they move forward with actually introducing the sandal. So this is what is called a sunk cost. Sunk costs are not included in our analysis, so we do not include that in our cash flow projections for this new sandals project. Now, moving forward again, we have that if Rocky Boots introduces these new sandals, it should boost the sales of their existing hunting boots by 3,000. So this is what is called a positive side effect. So it's increasing sales of another project. So a side effect is used in our analysis. So it's going to boost the hunting boot sales by 3,000 units. And each hunting boot sells for $84 per, uh, per boot. So this is what is called that positive side effect. So when they introduce sandals, their hunting boots actually increase as well. So we are going to have a positive side effect to our hunting boot sales of $252,000. This would be something that would be added to our initial sales projections from the sandal alone. So we will add that to our sales uh, projections for the sandal alone. But then we also see that by introducing this new sandal, it's actually going to reduce the sales of their casual boots by 8000 per year. So this is what is called erosion, a negative side effect to introducing this new sandal. So we need to deduct 8000 casual boots per year at a casual boot sale of $42 per, per boot for a loss in sales due to erosion of 336000 So we would subtract this from the sandal sales and the increase in hunting boots to get an overall sales figure of $488,000 for the launching of this new project. So they expect that if they introduce this new sandal, their sales figure would be $488,000 in sales per year when they consider all the different relevant cash flows, all the different cash flows that would only occur if they take on this new project. Now, that's just a top line figure. That's just your top line item on your income statement. But that will give you an idea as to what the sales amount should be when they go into evaluating all of the cash flows for this particular sandal project. So. Let's go into uh, identifying the different cash flows that will be utilized or how do you come up with a final cash flow amount uh, like we had in Chapter 9 where they said that the cash flows uh, total would be uh, some amount. Now we need to go into how do they actually get that total value. So what we introduce now is what is called a pro forma financial statement. A pro forma financial statement is financial statements that project future year's operations. So what we'll be doing is creating projections on what the balance sheet and the income statement will look like and then pulling information from these pro forma uh, financial statements to generate the cash flows associated with the project. Now this is accounting information and what we need to do is uh, convert it into cash flows. Uh, back in chapter two, we actually introduced calculating cash flows, and this is the same concept, except now we're actually utilizing it on a specific project as opposed to the entire company's uh, cash flows. So project cash flow also goes by free cash flow, and then the way that you've seen it previously is cash flow from assets. And this was something that was, again, discussed in Chapter 2, cash flow from assets. So the equation is not any different. So these are just some different terms for this project cash flow, the cash flows from the actual project that's under consideration. And it is project operating cash flow. So OCF, we discussed this again in Chapter 2, project change in networking capital, which was change in networking capital, and then project capital spending, which was net capital spending. So again, hopefully we already have a little bit of an understanding of how to calculate these cash flows. Um, 
as we have discussed this in chapter two, but now what we do is just go another step further and actually apply it to a specific project that's under consideration. Now, all of these cash flows uh, uh, equations are listed in the chapter 10 handout uh, where we have the cash flow identity, cash flow from assets, cash flow to creditors, cash flow to stockholders. And what we are focusing on here is the cash flow from assets to, uh, to generate the cash flows associated with the project. Main thing is calculating operating cash flow. So as you remember from chapter two, operating cash flow is EBIT, your earnings before interest and taxes from your income statement, plus depreciation and amortization minus taxes. Or another way that you might see it is take your EBIT, multiply it by one minus the tax rate and add back in depreciation and amortization. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a scenario of, an, of a projected project and create these pro forma financial statements and then take this accounting information and convert it into cash flows using this equation here. So here what we are evaluating is what is called or is a water repellent project. Their estimated sales are 40,000 cans per year, $5 per can. Cost per can is $3.50. The project lifespan is three years. Fixed costs are 11000 per year. The initial equipment cost to get things started is $60,000. Also, to launch the project, they have to make an additional $15,000 investment in networking capital. Keep in mind, you get this back at the end of the project. Their tax rate is 34%, and their cost of capital, or remember from Chapter 9, your required rate of return is 18 percent now once again the financing costs or however they're going to fund the startup of this project those costs go into this and that's why we say that financing costs are not used as a relevant cash flow so the first thing that we are going to create is this pro forma income statement so a pro forma income statement once again is just a projected income statement so you have to think of what are the different components of your income statement you start off with sales they said 40,000 units at $5 a unit, so our sales figure would be $20,000. Variable cost would be the 40,000 times $3.50 for a variable cost of 140,000. Our gross profit sales minus variable cost is 60,000. We have fixed cost per year of 11,000. Depreciation said was straight line to zero, so we take the investment in fixed assets and divide it by the lifespan of the asset. So three years, so we have $20,000 in depreciation each year. So our earnings before interest and taxes is 29,000. Tax is 34%, and then net income is 19140 Now, with this project, they don't say anything about any increases or anything in terms of their number of units sold per year. So this is their pro forma income statement for years one through three of the project. Their pro forma income statement does not fluctuate. Now let's look at a very basic and condensed pro forma balance sheet. We're, we're primarily uh, most concerned with this pro forma income statement for generating the operating cash flow. And then the pro forma balance sheet is what we look at for what types of investments were necessary to start the project. So here's our, proje our, our projected capital requirements or our, our investments in our assets to help generate those cash flows. As was mentioned, we had an initial investment of 15000 in networking capital. We keep that balance consistent here for this project. It would obviously fluctuate the more detailed uh, your analysis is for a year-by-year -year, uh, basis. But here we're just saying that we keep that same $15,000 investment. And we'll, we'll understand that we will sell through this $15,000 balance at the end of the project and recoup that as a cash inflow. Now, your initial investment in fixed assets was $60,000, but you are depreciating $20,000 per year based on the straight line depreciation. So our ending balance for fixed assets is zero. And so the total investment showcases on our balance sheet of $75,000 in year one, but then due to depreciation, our total, uh, uh, our total balance on our income statement, or on our balance sheet, sorry, um, is actually decreasing even though no cash is actually leaving the company. So realize that net fixed assets declines by the amount of depreciation each year, and then our total investment equals book or accounting value, not necessarily the market value. And so what we need to do is take this uh, this. Um, book value stuff and convert it into actual cash flows. So going back to our pro forma income statement, let's go ahead and calculate operating cash flow using the equations on the previous slide. So let's go ahead and use operating cash flow equation one and two and showcase that we'll get the same operating cash flow um, re regardless of which scenario we use. So operating cash flow, the equation is EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. So we say EBIT of 29,000 plus depreciation of 20,000 
minus taxes of 9860 and our operating cash flow our cash flow from operations for this project is 39140 or you could use the other equation that says that operating cash flow is equal to your EBIT 29000 multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate 0.34 and then you add in the depreciation amount of 20,000 and you get an operating cash flow of 39,140. Same same difference. I prefer using this operating cash flow equation in my calculations. Use whichever one you would uh, you feel most comfortable with, but my my calculations will be using equation number 1 here. So those are the cash flow from operations. The first part in your cash flow from assets or your project cash flow is operating cash flow minus any uh, change in networking capital minus any capital spending. So now let's take this information. You can see that in year zero, we do not have any operating cash flow because the project has not yet been launched. So we do not have a value there for operating cash flow in year zero. But to get the project launched, we did have to make a $15,000 investment in networking capital and a $60,000 investment in fixed assets for a total cash flow from assets or project cash flow of negative $75,000. This is our initial cash flow to get the project started. In our previous calculations or our previous problems in chapter 9, that is your CF0. Now in year 1, our project brings in $39,140 in operating cash flow. This is what we just calculated on the pro forma income statement slide. We did not have any in investment in networking capital or fixed assets for the year, so our project cash flow for year one is simply $39,140, so this would be CO1. Same for year two. Now, in, in real life, in, in practical terms, that operating cash flow would typically fluctuate due to increases in sales figures as the project continues to grow. In our case here, simplifying things, we just have the same operating cash flow cash flow. Once again, no additional investments in networking capital or capital spending. So our total project cash flow for year two is 39140 We can signify that as CO2. Now here's the difference in year three. We still have the same operating cash flow, but notice that we recoup that $15,000 initial investment in networking capital. Still no uh, capital spending um, here in the last year of the project, but we have 39140 in operating cash flow plus the 15000 that we brought back in changes in networking capital. So our total project cash flow for year three is 54140 and this would be your CO3 in our calculations that when we're solving for net present value or internal rate of return, those different projects or those different methods that we discussed in Chapter 9. Now, just elaborating on this, showcasing how it would look on a pro forma income statement and then generating these cash flows, notice that on the pro forma income statement, obviously in year zero, the project has not yet been launched, so we do not have any cash flow from operations or, or an income statement for year zero. The project is uh, still being considered at this time. Then for years one, two, and three, the pro forma income statements look identical because we did not have any increases in sales or costs or anything throughout. So we have that same 19140 net income. Using our operating cash flow equations, this chart is the exact same as the last chart, and then we can go ahead and use our previous uh, capital budgeting techniques, where as I mentioned, CF0, CO1, CO2, and CO3, and we can solve for net present value. Uh, they told us that the cost of capital, your required rate of return, was 18%. If you take all of these cash flows and discount them back at an 18% discount rate, the net present value would be 19,230.51. Calculating the internal rate of return, you get 32.60%. And as we discussed in chapter nine, since we are evaluating a single project that has conventional cash flows, both of these uh, capital budgeting methods will give you the same accept or reject. Uh, decision. And so in this case, we can see that we actually have two decisions that will tell us that this project would actually increase the value of the company. So this would be a situation where we would accept this project based on our estimation, estimations of future cash flows. So that's essentially what we're doing in this chapter is we are taking uh, what we learned in Chapter 9, net present value and internal rate of return and other capital budgeting methods, and we're going a little bit more in detail and identifying here's the project under analysis. How do I take this project and our estimates and actually generate the cash flows that will be used 
in our calculations. And to do so, you created pro forma income statement, identify what your investments are in fixed and current assets, and then you use our operating cash flow equations um, in addition to uh, these additional investments to find your uh, cash flows for the particular project. So a little bit more on networking capital. Why do we have to consider changes in networking capital separately? Well, first of all, remember from Chapter 2, the generally accepted accounting principles require that sales be recorded on the income statement when they are made, not when cash is received. So that is your realization principle. Also, remember that GAAP re, uh, requires that we record costs of goods sold uh, when the corresponding sales are made, whether we have actually paid our suppliers yet. So that's your matching principle. And so by looking at the changes in networking capital, we can identify when the cash flows are actually coming in and, co and going out. So uh, lastly, finally, we have to buy inventory to support sales, although we have not actually collected cash sales yet. And as I mentioned, we are concerned with the dollars in, less dollars out. And by looking at networking capital separately, we are able to really focus on um, the dollars in versus dollar out amount. Okay, so let's go into more of a discussion on depreciation. So the depreciation expense used for capital budgeting should be the depreciation schedule required by the IRS for tax purposes. You can actually depreciate, uh, as, you can depreciate your fixed assets two ways. Uh, so keep in mind that, I'll talk about the two ways here shortly. Depreciation itself is a non-cash expense. So we deduct it on our income statement even though no cash is actually leaving the firm. However, it is relevant because it affects taxes and taxes are a part of our cash flow. So we do, uh, depreciation does impact your project cash flow. So how you utilize depreciation um, and what method you use does impact the cash flows associated with the project. Now the depreciation tax shield, which is the depreciation amount per year multiplied by the marginal tax rate that year, is it showcases the amount saved in taxes by utilizing depreciation. So what is this, what it is showcasing is if I were to take the depreciation expense uh, multiplied by the tax rate, that will tell me how much I've actually saved in taxes by using that depreciation on the asset to decrease my taxable income. So the depreciation tax yield is something that is relevant um, because it is identifying how much you actually save in taxes, which is a cash flow, by utilizing this non-cash expense of depreciation, reducing the value of your assets even though no cash is actually leaving the company. So as I mentioned, there are two methods for computing depreciation. What we did in our first example was we did straight line depreciation. Very few assets are depreciated straight line for tax purposes. Instead, they use what is called makers, the modified accelerated cost recovery system. Now, when you are utilizing makers, you need to know which asset class is appropriate for tax purposes. So assets are, are assigned a tax or a lifespan, and hence their, their asset uh, value is depreciated using different percentages uh, due, or depending on the lifespan of that particular asset. The key when you're using makers is to multiply the percentage, percentage given in the table always by the initial cost because you are fully depreciating the entire asset or the initial asset value. Once again, you do depreciate to zero and it does use a mid-year convention, which you'll showcase or you'll see um, will end up having you depreciate one extra year um, in, in relation to what the asset's lifespan is. So let's take a look at the modified accelerated cost recovery system. So as I mentioned, the first thing you do is you take your asset and identify what its class is. So you can see that three-year assets are, uh, some examples are equipment used in research. Five-year assets are automobiles or computers, and seven-year assets are most industrial equipment. And so then what you do is once you identify what asset class you're in, you take the value or the initial investment in the asset, and you multiply it by these percentages each year to fully depreciate your asset. And it's called the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System because you depreciate more early on, meaning you experience more of a depreciation benefit in the early years and then less in the, in the later years. And as I mentioned, it does use a mid-year convention. So three-year assets are depreciated over four years, five-year assets are depreciated over six, and seven-year assets are depreciated over eight. But all of these percentages in these scenarios add up to 100%. Because you are depreciating 100% of the asset over its lifespan. You're just depreciating different amounts each year. So let's take a look at an example. We purchase a computer system for $24,000. So this is our initial value. This is the amount that we are depreciating. 
and they want to know what will be the depreciation expense each year and what will be the beginning and ending book values each year. So what we'll have to do is create a little chart here. Um, and since we are looking at a computer system, you can look back at the types of uh, the asset classes. A computer system is a five-year asset, so we are going to be depreciating this over a six-year time frame. Now, I already have the chart uh, essentially uh, filled out for us, but notice that the value of our asset is 24000 That's the value of the computer that we are depreciating. If you look at the percentages on the previous slide for a five-year asset, you depreciate 20% in, in year one, 32% in year two, 19.2% in year three, 11.52% in year four, 11.52% in year five, and then 5.76% in year six. And these percentages, what's key is that these percentages are always multiplied to the initial value of the asset. Otherwise, you won't depreciate the full value of the asset. The biggest mistake here is you take these percentages and you multiply it by the beginning book value. That is incorrect. So please be advised that these percentages are always multiplied by the initial value of the asset. So the value of the asset starts off at 24,000. We multiply the value, uh, the initial value by 20%. So 4,800 will be depreciated in year one. The ending book value then is 19,200. That becomes your beginning book value. Then you take that 32% for year two's depreciation and multiply it by the initial value and you get a depreciation expense in year two of 7,680. You subtract that 7,680 from the beginning book value and you end up getting an ending book value of 11,520 and you do so continuously until the value of the asset is zero at the end of the depreciation schedule. So, this leads us to a discussion on book value versus market value. Obviously, these are book values, the value of the asset on our books. So this is what would be showcasing as the value on our balance sheet for the value of this $24,000 computer. But what is the difference between book value and, and market value? Well, book value is what the asset is recorded at in accounting books, whereas market value is what the asset is actually worth if you sell it out in the market. So if there is a difference, well... Let's first talk about what is salvage value. Salvage value is what you can get for an asset at the end of a project. So what can I salvage my asset for at the end of some project? So let's say they invested in that computer on the previous example, and the project is a five-year lifespan, and they want to sell the computer at the end of five years. What could I get market value for that computer? That is what is called a salvage value. If there is a difference between the market value at the end of the project and the book value, so how much you've depreciated on your, on your books, then there is a tax effect. If you depreciate too much on your books, then you have a tax liability when you sell your asset. And then if you depreciate too little on your books, not experiencing enough of a, of a depreciation tax benefit, then you actually have a tax uh, benefit at, uh, when you sell that as asset um, at its salvage value. So your book value is simply the initial cost minus the accumulate, accumulated depreciation. And then your after-tax salvage value, since we're always concerned with after-tax uh, values, uh, and, and you would have some type of tax effect if you do sell the value or the asset at the end of the project. Your after-tax salvage value says you take the salvage value or the selling price minus the tax rate and then the difference between your salvage value and your book value. So what is the difference on your books between what the market price is and what the book, uh, book value is? And if you depreciated too much, then your uh, if you depreciate too much, then your book value will exceed your salvage value, uh, and meaning that you will actually have a tax liability. And if you depreciated too little, then your book or sorry, if you depreciate too much, your book value will be um, smaller than what the salvage value is. So you'll have a tax liability. And because you've experienced too much of the depreciation benefits, and then vice versa, if your um, if your book value is too high, meaning that you did not depreciate enough on your books, then you will get a tax benefit. As you'll see, you'll have a negative value here um, at the end. So let's take a look at an example, try to uh, better um, clarify what I'm talking about in terms of a tax benefit for, versus a tax liability. Here we have the beginning and ending book values of a five-year asset. Once again, the five-year asset is being depreciated over six periods. Um, and then here's our net salvage cash flow, so your after-tax salvage value. And you can see that they have selling price and book value notated slightly differently from the previous equation, but the same, uh, same equations. So let's, uh, let's say at the end of year five, you sell the asset for $3,000. 
your book value is $691.20. So what happens here is you've actually experienced too much of a depreciation benefit over the first five years, meaning that you've experienced more of a tax benefit because depreciation uh, decreases your taxable income. So now when you sell that asset at the end of the five years, you actually have to pay taxes on the difference between what the market value is and what you have on your books. So the after cash cash flow, so the after tax cash flow, which here they are notating with net salvage cash flow, is 3000 uh, minus and then Figure out what the difference is between the market value and book value, and you're going to pay taxes on that at 34%. So even though you're selling the asset for a $3,000 market value, you're going to have to pay $784.99 in additional taxes on that sale uh, on that sale because you depreciated too much over the first five years, too much of a tax benefit over the first five years. Now, on the other hand, let's say you sell the asset at the end of year two for $4,000. So here... The book value is too, or, or the book value is substantially higher than what you're getting on the market value. So that means you did not depreciate enough over the first two years, and so now you actually end up getting a, a tax benefit. So you have the minus and negative here, and you're selling it for four thousand. But the after-tax cash flow with the tax benefit is actually going to be four thousand five hundred ninety-eight dollars and forty cents. So let's do one more example, um, and you can actually solve for this after-tax salvage value without actually creating the full um, beginning value, ending value of your assets, and we'll discuss how to do that here um, on the next example. So here we are calculating the after-tax salvage value where we have an asset that is used in a four-year project, but the asset falls in the five-year makers class. So it is going to be depreciated over six years and our project is only lasting four. So the asset has an acquisition cost of $6.4 million. That is our initial investment in the asset. That is the amount that we will be depreciating. And our salvage value, the market value at the end is $1.53 million. So is that $1.53 million market value, does it exceed our book value? Or is it less than our book value? What type of tax implications will there be? Will, the, will there be a tax benefit or a tax liability? Our tax rate is 34%, and they want to know what is the after-tax salvage value. So the first thing we need to do is identify what is the book value of this asset and then compare it to the 1.53 um, market value. So looking back at your depreciation uh, percentages, and this is, again, in the handout, so you should have reference to it um, as we're going through this discussion, a five-year makers class uh, over the first four years, since this is a four-year project, uh, the five-year asset is depreciated 20% in year one, 32% in year two, 19.2% in year three, and then 11.52% in year four. So without creating the full, uh, the full beginning and ending value um, depreciation schedule, I can just add up these four percentages and realize that 82.72% of the asset has been depreciated, right? So if I add up all those four years of percentages, 82.72% of the asset has been depreciated. So if 82.72% of the asset has been depreciated, I can take that 6.4 million and actually multiply it by the amount that remains. So 100% of the asset is going to be depreciated 82.72% has already uh, been depreciated, so 17.28% remains. So I take that 6.4 million and I multiply it by 0.1728, and this tells me that the book value at the end of the fourth year would end up being 1,105,920. Now you could create that full uh, depreciation schedule like we did in the previous example by doing year over year. This is just a condensed, uh, simplified version where first figure out how much has been depreciated. If that much has been depreciated, how much remains? And multiply the initial value by how much remains to get the book value at that time period. Now what we're going to do is actually calculate the after-tax salvage value by using the equations that we've done previously. So to just kind of get an idea before we even start, whoops, sorry. The market value is 1.53. Our books is 1.105 uh, and some change million. So we've already we've actually depreciated too much 
over the first four years. So we should have a tax liability at the end of this four-year project when I end up salvaging this asset. But we can verify this by using our after-tax salvage value equation that says you take the salvage value and then you are paying taxes, which in this case is 34%, on the difference between what the salvage value is and the book value. And so what we get is 1.53 million in our salvage value, but I'm actually going to have to pay taxes on the difference here, and my tax expense is actually going to be $144,187.20, and you can verify this. And so the after-tax salvage value, since I depreciated too much on my books over the first four years, I'm now going to have an after-tax salvage value that is less than the market value, and it ends up being $1,385,812.80. So that is calculating the after-tax salvage value on an asset. First thing you have to do is calculate what is the book value. And then once you get what the book value is, you compare that book value to the market value. And if you're having troubles kind of identifying whether or not it's going to be a tax liability or a tax benefit, you need to make sure you utilize the equation correctly. But you should be able to see that, hey, the book value is less than what the market value is. I've experienced too much of a tax benefit by utilizing too much depreciation over the first four years. So I'm now going to have this tax liability that I'm going to have to end up deducting from my salvage value when I sell this asset. So that is after-tax salvage value. Moving on, uh, let's continue with depreciation and after-tax salvage again. Let's say I purchase equipment for $100,000, cost $10,000 to have it delivered and installed. Installation costs actually go into the value of the asset being depreciated. So the full value of the asset is going to be $110,000. Based on past information, I believe that I can sell the equipment for $17,000 when I'm done with it in six years. Marginal tax rate is 40%. What is the depreciation expense each year and the after-tax salvage value in year six for each of the following situations? So all we're doing here is just looking at what would happen to the after-tax salvage value um, utilizing different maker's uh, schedules. First, let's say the asset falls in a three-year maker's. Here we have the percentages for a three-year maker's. Notice that each of these percentages is going to be multiplied by the initial value of the asset, the 110000 Now, at the end of the project, six years in, if this is depreciating 100% of your asset, it should make sense then that at the end of the fourth year, the book value is going to be zero. And so if we're selling it for 17000 the salvage value, we're going to have to pay taxes on that difference between the market value and the book value. And you can see here that it ends up being 6800 and our after-tax salvage is $10,200. So we depreciated too much over the first uh, six years of the project, actually depreciated, much, uh, depreciated it too much over a four-year project or, or over a four-year depreciation schedule. And so what we end up having is a tax liability when we sell the asset at the end of the six-year project. Now let's see what happens with a seven-year maker's chart. Once again, just emphasizing that these uh, percentages are all being multiplied by the initial value of the asset, 110000 And what we can see here then is the we're only looking, even though it's a seven-year maker's in which it would be depreciated over eight years, we're only looking at the first six years since this is a six-year uh, project that we're evaluating. So starting off with the $110,000 value and subtracting each year's depreciation amount, my book value would be 14729 once again, the market value exceeds our book value. We've experienced too much of a tax benefit, so we will have a tax liability when we sell this asset. The, the impact is much smaller, however, and we can see that our after-tax salvage value is $16,091.60. So in all of these calculations, when you are looking at this after-tax salvage value, the value of the asset at the end of the project, this goes into your project cash flows where you have operating cash flow plus or minus change in networking capital plus or minus... Uh, net capital spending. This after-tax salvage value goes into this net capital spending. So in year zero to start the project, this seventeen thousand would actually be a cash outflow, and then at the end of the project, when I sell the asset, this sixteen thousand ninety-one dollars and sixty cents would be a cash inflow. So it's a cash outflow in the early years, and then a cash inflow at the end of the years. And all of this remembers is your cash flow from assets or your project cash flow or free cash flow. And so this is all going into our, our cash flow projections um, 
before we actually analyze the cash flows using net present value IRR methods. So last thing, uh, before we conclude here, chapter 10, other methods for computing operating cash flow. There are other equations that you can use for operating cash flow as opposed to the EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes equation that we had previously. One would be the bottom-up approach, uh, which is simply taking net income plus depreciation and amortization, and this works only when there is no interest expense. You also have the top-down approach, so just don't subtract your non-cash deductions of depreciation, so just sales minus cost minus taxes. And then this is my preferred approach, and you'll see me do this in a lot of my examples. It's called the tax shield approach. You simply do sales minus costs multiplied by one minus taxes plus that depreciation tax shield, so the amount that you save in taxes by utilizing depreciation. The reason why I use this particular method, I'm just going to highlight it if it will allow me to, or star it. The reason why I use this particular method is that you can actually solve for operating cash flow without creating that pro forma income statement if you know what your sales and cost figures are and your depreciation expense each year. Um, so most of my calculations utilize this equation for operating cash flow, but if you want to be more consistent with what we've done previously, this is the equation that we learned in chapter two. And so you just need to first create your pro forma income statement before you can use that operating cash flow equation. So that concludes our discussion here on chapter 10. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about anything, and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye.